What do you do when you find things around you are getting worse? What do you do when your best attempts to make things better seem to backfire? I think there are times when we sense our own powerlessness to change a situation, but we believe we are still called nonetheless to try. My Old Testament professor in seminary was a dear man, and he had a wonderfully dry wit. And he would remind us, what doesn't kill you may make you stronger, but it also may leave you in a crumpled heap on the side of the road. (laughs) Haven't you been there? How should we, as people of faith, face hard times? How do we live well in those times when we realize that we have little control of the world around us? I mean, let's face it, we desperately want to believe that we are in charge. A lot of the time, we can even fool ourselves into believing that we are in charge, that we are in control. We like to talk like it. We like to post our rants on Facebook. But there comes a point in our lives, in every one of our lives, where we are face to face with our limitations and the fact that we are not, in fact, in control. As we watch the moral decay around us, the confusion, the anger, the division, we can feel a bit helpless. What can we do? But more than that, I think the question we should be asking is, what are we called to do? This is why I think today's lesson is from the from the book of Judges is so timely for us. Gideon is wrestling with frustrations like ours. He sees the problems around him. He senses the division and the anger among his people. He sees the problems, but he cannot see a solution. If you know your Bible, you know that Gideon becomes an amazing, yet far from perfect, leader of Israel. So let me set the stage and give you some context for what's going on in this passage. The book of Judges tells us of the events after Israel has entered the Promised Land, but before the time of the kings. You may recall that Moses led the people of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. But because of their lack of faith and their lack of trust in God, they spent 40 years in the wilderness learning those important lessons. Then Joshua succeeds Moses as leader of Israel, and he finally leads them into the promised land. Now, the land wasn't empty, so they began a conquest of the land which God had given them, beginning with Jericho. And the book of Joshua records Israel's various battles and conquests in the land. Then comes the book that we are in today, Judges. The land had not completely been won, in large part due to Israel's lack of obedience. They were facing some serious challenges, one of which are their neighbors, who seem to constantly invade, reinvade, and oppress them. And another challenge they are facing is their tendency toward idolatry spiritual compromise, and general lack of faithfulness to God. To lead the people back to faithfulness and continue the conquest of the land, God sends judges. The book of Judges records the lives of several of these people and their ministries in Israel, people you may have heard of, like Deborah and Gideon and Samson. There are a number of others as well, lesser known, Ehud, Shamgar, Tola, Japheth, and others. But when we think of judges, we think of our modern-day courtroom judges. If you're thinking of Judge Judy, you're incorrect. That's not what the judges were. The judges of Israel were less Judge Judy and more Rambo. The judges of Israel were military and civic leaders of the nation. And the book of Judges has some really wild stories in it, too. If you want to read some wild stories, read Judges. But the book records the sad and sobering decline of the spiritual life of Israel and the need for godly leaders to lead them. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Judges, chapter 6. If you don't have your Bibles, you get a pass for this week, but bring it next week. We are people of word and sacrament and students of the scriptures, so we need our textbooks with us, right? It's also in your bulletin, so if you need it, it's there. (laughs) To understand today's passage, which records the calling of Gideon, 
We've got to go back to the beginning of chapter 6, which is really where Gideon's story begins. Chapter 6, verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Now, the Midianites were a rough bunch. The early verses of chapter 6 describe how they would wait for Israel to plant crops and then would invade, eat the crops, and keep moving. Sort of like a a, a human locust that would just move through the land, just taking everything they they wanted. And Israel was reduced. These, These people who were given this land, who were in their promised land, were reduced to hiding in mountain hideouts and in caves. Now, throughout Exodus and Deuteronomy and Joshua, the people have been told again and again that if they love and obey the Lord, things will go well with them. And if they don't, things won't. And time and again, they pledge their fidelity, but they continue to disobey. Their lack of obedience and their lack of faithfulness and their rebellious spirit damages their relationship with God. And clearly here, God is disciplining them. It's similar to what we read in Romans chapter 1, when St. Paul talks in the New Testament about the unfaithfulness of people. Listen to how St. Paul puts it and see if we can't make a connection here. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is the, the human temptation This is the temptation of of almost every generation of believers. Israel up to today. They knew God. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images revealing mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So basically, the worship that was due God, they begin to worship themselves. Do we not see this today in in so many ways? I mean, we're not even into the passage, but we have an important lesson in front of us. Continued rebellion against God has consequences. And sometimes the consequences are simply the natural results of our sin. Sometimes the consequences we are are allowed by God to play out so that he can bring us to repentance. That is why a lackadaisical attitude towards our sin and toward disobedience, which is so sadly common among Christians, is also so deadly. I wonder how many people really feel the weight of the words that we say in our confession, which we'll say in a few minutes. When we confess that our sins provoke most justly your righteous anger against us. Or later, when we say that the burden of them, our sins, is more than we can bear. In the book of homilies, book one, homily two, it says, Let us all confess with mouth and heart that we are full of imperfections. Let us know our own works, how imperfect they are, and then we shall not stand foolishly, foolishly and arrogantly in our own conceits, nor think that we can obtain justification by our own merits and works. Look, the reason this is so crucial, and the reason I, I harp on this so much, is because if we really don't understand sin, then we really don't understand the gospel. My friends, dare to see your sin for what it is. And dare to seek the Lord who is merciful and the only one who can truly and decisively deal with your sin. But make no mistake, as it was with Israel, so it is with us that sometimes we can claim to be wise and become fools. (coughs) All right, back to Judges. We're moving in a more positive direction, but we've got to deal with this. We've set the stage. Now look at the first verse in today's lesson, verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, 
while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, I know that most of us are not familiar with threshing wheat and wine presses too much. But you normally thresh wheat on a threshing floor. It was a raised platform so that the wind would separate the wheat from the shaft. But he's doing this in hiding, using a wine press to do it, which is far from ideal. But it, it, because it was carved into a rock, it was probably hidden from view. So this shows how desperate Israel was, how fearful they were of the oppression of the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appears to him in verse 12. And says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. What? Remember, at this point, Gideon has done nothing. This isn't the Gideon that we know later. This is is Gideon early days. Mighty man of valor? He's hiding in a wine press. Mighty man of valor indeed. And here Gideon pours out his heart, his frustration, and his sadness. Verse 13. Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. The first line of Gideon's is to tell. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? But we know why all this has happened to them. We just read it. Verse 1 of chapter 6. It's because of Israel's disobedience, as we read in the first verse of 6. But notice that this is not what the angel is concerned about. The angel doesn't even address this question. He continues in verse 14. Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? What might of his do we see? Nothing. It's almost, there's an echo here of the call of Moses. And most scholars believe that's intentional. Remember, Moses did not think he was worthy or strong enough or of good speech to be able to. To do what God had called him to do. And so Gideon feels he is unworthy of the task. Verse 15. Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. You don't see too much here that that tells us that this is a mighty man of valor, do we? Excuses. Reasons he can't do what God's calling him to do. Everything seems so far out of his control. The Lord persists down to verse 16. But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. So what are the lessons for us in this passage? I think it's found in each of the primary statements of the Lord to Gideon. Verse 12, the Lord is with you. Verse 14, do I not send you? Verse 16, but I will be with you. Do things look terrible, Gideon? The Lord is with you. You don't understand why these things are happening? The Lord is with you. You don't feel up to the task? Do I not send you? Do you you feel overwhelmed by what you have to do? The Lord is with you. Here's the key. The mighty man of valor is only the mighty man of valor because the Lord is with him. The key for us today when we face uncertain times, when we often feel things are out of our control, or we feel unable to affect real change for the kingdom or make a real difference, is to remember the abiding presence of the Lord is our strength. Talk to me. There you go. Listen to his promises to us. First of all, we just celebrated Christmas not too long ago. It feels like a long time ago. It wasn't that long ago. Oh, come, oh, come. 
The very name Emmanuel means God with us. God with us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? That's an amazing claim. That's an amazing promise. And we hear it echoed throughout the liturgy in just a few minutes when we pray the prayer of humble access. That we may be in him and he in us. Romans 8, 38, 39. Two of my favorite verses. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, which means what? He is with you. John 14, 16 and 17, Jesus speaking, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The presence of the Lord, the idea that the Lord is with you and me is not just a nice sentiment. It is the sustaining and equipping power of God at work in our lives. What is interesting is that this principle is not just an Old Testament principle. It's not just for Gideon. It's a New Testament promise for each of those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. God is with you. When God goes to reassure his people, when he wants them to be bold, when he encourages them not to give up, when he holds them in the midst of their pain, he almost always says the same thing. Do not fear. I am with you. Friends, it is easy to be discouraged sometimes. Sometimes we, like Gideon, get despondent and frustrated and feel the world is closing in on us. But take heart. Whatever challenges you are facing, whatever heartache you feel, whatever anxiety you are dealing with, your God is with you. How do we move forward with confidence and trust and faithfulness when times are tough? By putting our whole faith In the one who has promised to be with us until the end of the age. Not dividing our faith in different areas that we want to put trust in. But putting all our faith in this one. In our Lord. He is still with you. Right here, right now. He is still with us right here and right now. Friends, you and the Lord are always a majority. His presence with you is always enough. Lean on it. Lean into it. Trust him. One of my favorite verses on this comes from Deuteronomy 31.8. It's a good one to mark in your Bibles or to write on a note card and stick on your mirror. Deuteronomy 31, 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. May it be so with us. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.